Hey, what's going on, guys? I just wanted to pop on here and give you a quick intro into this podcast with Paper Alpha. You guys might have seen him around FinTwit. He's uh, got a sub stack, does a lot of just great work giving information out there to people who are trying to learn about um, investing in, especially in the bond space. The guy has 20 years of experience in the uh, institutional side of bonds and macro manages his own capital now has has trained people and helped them become better investors before and uh generally just awesome person it was a great conversation i think it went over an hour um i'm mentally drained and blown from it but uh it was great i hope you guys enjoy it and if you can go give him a follow give him a sub if you guys want more information he has a uh, subscription sub stack that you can go follow and uh it's just going to help you become better at what you do lots of of experience and knowledge um that he was able to to put out in such a small period of time definitely worth a listen enjoy episode three of invest with instinct with uh paper alpha see ya. all right guys so we've been uh actually chatting here a little while um paper alpha and i uh, and and I'll get back to introducing him, but just on the topic that we were previously talking about, um, you know, one one thing uh, we're we're going a, a bit philosophical, but one thing is like just uh, can I what can I call you shorthanded paper alpha every time is going to be tough. I'm just going to say uh, paper paper fine, but uh, um, yeah so, sure paper so, paper yeah, paper PA. so p a yeah, paper alpha has so many options. Um, so for this past Anything quarter, like. um, as I'm learning to, uh, take my ego and my bias away from what I am potentially seeing as outcomes and trading what I'm seeing that's actually happening right now, it's been a really tough go. This is probably, this is my first losing quarter in, uh, I was talking to somebody else about it, probably like seven years or something like that. And there was a point like two weeks ago where I was like, just laughing. I was just like, because there are so many times where I was like, you know, I kind of hope I go through a big downswing to come out of it. And like, um, I, I had said this to a mental coach I was working with. I was like, I kind of hope that I go through a big downswing so that I can like work my way out of it and become like more of a confident trader. And I remember he was like, why? Like, and I was like, well, you know, cause like, uh, it would like really toughen me up and like whatever. And he's like, yeah, but like, why, you know, he, he was like, I see what you're saying, but like, you, you kind of have this thing that's working and you're steadily improving over time. And you're thinking about all these things and you're, you're trying to amplify what you're gonna, he's like, what, why add in the like unnecessary, large elongated downswing. And I, I kind of finally reached the point where I was like, okay, fine. I, you know, you're right. I can. I can go a whole career without like a, a lasting downswing and still become better and better without having to like feel some crazy pain. But ironically, here we are months and months of a uh, kind of knife wound trading. Um, the market's kind of berating me in a sense. And, and like we were talking about, it's very one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's very me versus me. Um, there's no, nobody sitting across the table from me to, to scoff at um and it's only learning through through doing so what what are your thoughts on um on that and then also like from your experience since you've been in markets a long time has there any been any big takeaways for you over long stretches of, of kind of losing or break even or or whatever that kind of changed you as a trader or any takeaways from that well, first of all, I would say you still have four days to make it. So I don't know whether you took your, your whole risk down, but you know, that's right. Um, really cool. Positivity, positivity <laughs> should never die uh, last. But uh, you know, maybe a couple of thoughts. Mike. first of all, congratulations that you have gone for such a long time without a down quarter mm -hmm. in brackets. Still four days ago, but um, which is an amazing achievement. Um, and well, we chatted a little bit about your style, I guess in 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 macro uh your 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 um distribution of negative and um and positive quarters at least is is a little bit more pronounced so that's the very definition of macro is like you know you need to uh given the the sort of longer term um trade horizons typically in and i'm talking about uh, more traditional uh, macro investing you need to you need to be prepared to take some uh, some downswings uh, to make the good ones so 
uh, a little reflection on that would point me to, um, well, the great financial crisis that I've, that I've gone through. Um, I think I opined on it on a few posts, but um, the, the, the background there was that uh, uh, you get massive hits followed by huge upswings just if you can keep obviously to your positions, right? Um, and uh, um, that, is, that is obviously against the notion that uh, there's strong autocorrelation between um, losing months, given that there's a strong indication from negative PNL that obviously your views or your positioning or both is wrong or your portfolio composition. So uh, what I would reflect um, more on is, um, I don't know whether you journal your, I don't know, your, your months, your weeks, your quarters, et cetera. Uh, just, a, just a good solid reflection on what has gone right and what has gone wrong and why it should be bouncing back, right? I mean, that is that is the most important aspect on, on bouncing back, of course. I, I do this personally for every month or quarter, just looking back. I mean, I've, I've also, um, on that notion, you, there's a flip flip side that uh, my, my um my losses also occurred uh, after like really strong quarters too, right? Mm -hmm. Typical macro investment when when suddenly you have um, something that that you anticipate happening uh, goes into your favor, but you're always obviously overextending yourself and getting closer to your uh, to to the market pricing exactly the scenario that you envisage. So with that, obviously you you have to be prepared that uh, you get setbacks of that of that view um, and and the market. Uh, Market's obviously humbling you after after a good harvest, so I would say it's um, I would say it's important, but it, it's really depending on your on your style. For me, um, you know, it, it goes with uh, w with it, um, especially on the long well, trading a little bit on the longer time horizons, to take uh, uh, losing quarters with it. Um, I, for once, I mean, this year also hasn't been hasn't been a fantastic year. I'm I'm small up. Um, uh, the last or this quarter is shaping up to be uh, better, uh, given the sort of uh, uh, selling selling rates generally and the steepening that is finally seems to be coming to fruition. Um, but uh, yeah, I uh, I am uh, I'm not I'm not, and I think that's also also important. I'm not taking too much of a of a hit on my on my ego uh, either way. Um, uh, well, not the not the negative hit nor the positive hit when I'm. When I'm uh, looking at uh, quarterly or monthly PLs, I'm, I'm just knowing that over time I will I will do well, given given um, you know that I've I've uh, uh, you know posted quite a few years of, of of good returns over my career. So that self belief, I guess, is is being is being founded exactly in those experiences, and I think even more so in the in the negative um, in the negative experiences. We talked a little bit b before about uh, you being sick over. Over the last few days, you know, it's a, uh, it's something I alluded to in today's attack the week and, and my Monday thoughts. When reflecting, I'm I'm actually in the in the house of my uh, mother-in-law who is now finally recovering. Uh, but you know, the older generation they're extremely resilient, and I fear, you know, the, the younger generation is is less so. But it, you can translate this obviously quite easily into financial markets and everything that you do that you need that you need a stressor in your system uh, to get better over time or be more resilient, right? Yeah. Um, and and in and in your example of of PNL, of course, I think um, the negative months and quarters will teach you something, hopefully, right? And if you can take away some things uh, out of that, I think that's where journaling is also important. Uh, will make it hopefully better, or it will make you uh, more aware of certain things that will either make you more money in the future or avoid even bigger drawdowns going forward. Right? So I would. You know, philosophically look at it as a as a positive angle to strengthening the overall system but yeah I, I i get it that when you look at your account it's probably mentally harder to do so but um i guess over time you also get a little bit more positive on that and and with reflection you're looking uh, you're looking forward to the many more positive quarters ahead yeah a couple of things there that that you mentioned that i think are important one yeah i've probably let my reflection go a bit right and i think that sometimes happens when everything's just going well like you're just not as um tedious uh and you know can get sloppy right so uh, only in the yeah. last month or two have i started going back and really 
trying to dissect like where am i losing money you know what i mean where why um like when am i losing it uh you know what are the reasons and i think a couple things i've come across are um not being able to let trades that were working that are now not working go um that's one and two is the environment has become what i like to like talked about this with other people where like there's this narrative compression that's happening where narratives are switching back and forth so so fast but the moves are so violent intraday and a lot of different things that like i'm very good personally at holding winners but in this environment, a lot of my winners that are working will end up coming back because I'm not actually just, I'm not, I, I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel where I think like, okay, all of this like back and forth stuff is ending, right? I finally found the trade that's going to exit this whole thing. And we're going to be a new trend, either up or down or whatever it may be. And I end up just giving back because it's just another range bound thing. And then that will tumbleweed into other decisions where I'm trying to force making back what I've given back. So these are some takeaways of like reflection that I think will make me a better trader because when I experience this again, I should theoretically be able to um, stop doing trades that aren't working so much quicker, uh, right? Being like, okay, this isn't working, but it worked before. So I'm going to do it again. Oh, it's still not working, but it worked before. So I'm going to keep doing it. I should be able to stop that. And I should be able to accept taking winners a bit faster. So those are some silver linings, um, that I've, that I've pulled out of this. And like you said, the other thing would be like experience, just like time in the seat. Like I can't imagine being able to have traded through the financial crisis. Like I just feel like the people who have spent time in markets prior to 2000 and whatever, six um, that have lasted all the way until now that there's like this unspoken wisdom that has probably come along with that in which you're, you're able to now maybe get off sides for a while in some of your portfolio positions. But like you've said, like you've kind of seen it all, like you've seen so many different events and regimes and, uh, things that you're able to not be thwarted and you're able to kind of stick with your convictions over a long time horizon and you're able to kind of like um ride those out so i'm just kind of uh reaffirming what you were saying there yes i mean they, i mean i haven't i haven't seen it all i mean <laughs> i've seen the past maybe the past ish uh, i mean hey man 20 so. 20 plus years like yeah you're gonna have true. more than a lot of people i'll, I'll just put it that yeah. way yeah However, as we also discussed, I think before you hit the record button, you know the uh, the everlasting evolution of of this business, whatever you call it, is the most exciting part. Right? I mean, uh, you always learn something new, and I and I also pined uh, on it actually today um, when uh, I posted this chart from uh, from the internet I found uh, from from Mr. Cow um, U.S. ten-year yields since seventeen ninety. And we're about we're just about now at the average of of that time frame. Oh, I was that it. like I the mean, four point one percent or something? Roughly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're we're yeah. Ju we're just now bang on the, at the average of of the last uh, what is it two hundred thirty years? You know, and and it, there is some recency bias. And as I said, I mean, I I obviously was uh, uh, a lot of my career was long bonds and you know made made uh, made a killing out of that. But you know uh, these regime shifts uh, uh, they creep up on you and. And if you have this overall dogmatic view that, you know, yes, I mean, overall trend go has to be low because productivity low, all, all of those are true, but, uh, you know, you don't, you don't appreciate that uh, when you look at term premium, for example, um, that we are still according, I mean, there's various models, but I'm, I'm talking about the ACM um, New York Fed model um, that is looking at term premium. And we are like a minus, a minus 50 basis points here's so a negative term premium versus the average over the last 50 years, I believe 50 or 60 years is plus 0.67. So, you know, call it, call it a hundred plus basis points uh, below the average in terms of term premium. Now there's different cycles, et cetera, but it gives you that sort of uh, unbi more unbiased view of what is, what is possible out there. Right? can, can yields spike to five, six, 7%. 
Yes, absolutely. The, the, yeah. the, the key question is, what is the probability that you attach to those things? And maybe just one more thing to uh, your, um, you know, uh, and great to, to hear about your reflection. Uh, when I talk about regime also, <clears throat> your microcosm of obviously your trading and your PL will tell you something about your personal biases, but it can also reflect on a, on a higher level, a secondary or ter- a third level a macro process in that to me, you know, I lose money when there's not much going on, exactly what you reflected on. If narratives are switching almost on a daily basis, we don't know where we are, um, how I opine, opined as well. It's actually, um, uh, you know, rates now being well, seen as reaching a plateau and we don't know where we're going to go from there. This is, uh, this is reducing short, uh, short rate volatility, but is is pushing that volatility into other markets because the uncertainty becomes greater, right? Nervousness increases if you, if you wish, because the tree of possibilities um, extends. And <clears throat> that is obviously, um, not the case if you're either in a tightening or an easing bias, as we obviously, uh, we are still in a tightening bias, but we had, you know, multitude of rate hikes. That gives you a little bit more forecastability and more certainty, ironically, in the market, even though things are moving, rather yeah. than when they're stopping now as a monetary policy lever. So maybe the reflection of negative p and um, is, and I had this uh, this year as well, is the, is the, um, is that we are really in a range by market. I mean, I like I like momentum trades, right? I mean, I don't know whether you yeah. look at uh, the, the model that I'm creating, but most of them are, you know, the usual uh, power lifters in in, uh, in anything in financial markets and uh, um, and in, you know, the observable world is momentum and, and the exhaustion of such a momentum, right? So uh, to me, that's indicative maybe on the second level, as I said, that there is uh, clearly a loss of direction and hence just a choppiness that uh, for me, for example, that is when I lose money. I don't know whether you've analyzed your 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 trading returns over different regimes and maybe um, and maybe analyze it from that angle, but that's maybe another input for you if you haven't done so to just to just have a another lens to look at your your returns exposed. Yes. Uh, I usually would say I'd, I'd use the VIX as like my thermometer there when, when we're at this, okay. um, middling VIX range where like there's intraday moves are happening, but it's, it's very choppy and uncertain or whatever. And we tend to be in this for a while, I think in 2021 or 2022 or something, we sat in the like mid twenties or something in the VIX for a long time. And I, didn't do that well there either it was more like a a small a small grind um in which i I, i'd prefer very low vix where markets are just slowly oscillating in like a predictable fashion or markets are trending in a predictable fashion or i'd like very high vix where everything is chaos like that's my favorite area right where efficiency is out the window it's all emotion it's all reactivity. It's all fast. And that's where order book traders do really well, right? We're not thinking three to yeah. six months. We're thinking three to six minutes, right? Like that's, but that just, I was having this chat with somebody who's like, you can't control when that environment comes, right? Like we're always praying for yeah. it and wishing for it, but like being able to like keep your seat. I always like to say, keep your seat at the table until those events happen. The problem is these days, it feels like those events are always around the corner. You know, like it, and yes. it, keep, it keeps me ready and then I'm pushing it at times. I shouldn't be pushing it. Um, and it's like so obvious in hindsight that like, it's all like, everything's just these little, little narratives being blown up left and right war and presidential stuff. And you could like just Russia and China and like, you know, there's all these things, um, that, but, but I, I do put it back on me to be like, okay, like you understand that now. And from, from now you can take that and be like, okay, until it's made obvious to you that the VIX is going fucking 40 plus and, and shit's hitting the fan. Like you should be able to now recognize that you're in this new realm. And if it's going to be in this realm for a while, which could be wide choppy narrative, flipping uncertainty, um, how do you then apply your strategy where you don't have to change your whole strategy, but what, what can you shift and alter in there to um, take advantage of the current environment that might last a long time? 
that's that's probably how I would start thinking about it from what you what you said. No, yeah, and that's absolutely right. And it's obviously it's um, it's also the question of allocation of energy and time, right? I mean, um, you know, you're you're sitting at home. I'm I'm investing my own money. When do you go on holiday? <laughs> it's like a it's a very simple question, right, to ask. I I I usually have to uh, fight with my wife over uh, certain times, etc. And I obviously look at my phone way too often than I should. But um, uh, the the thing is, you can never detach. I like. Uh, when I when I you know took on graduate whatever they all want to go into investing business is, uh, the first thing you tell them is you could possibly will never be able to de- totally detach yourself from markets right yeah um, and that's very much true the it's obviously I mean I, I sleep well at night but you know there were times that I that I that I didn't or I don't because I'm overexcited especially on those on those elements of, of high volatility regimes right which are which can take quite a few months but. Um, I guess it's it's part of getting older where you don't have indefinite energy anymore. I, I try to think more about those stages of the, you know, when the game really gets going, right? Um, and try to preserve both my mental, but also my obviously financial capital uh, to some extent to to really go for those, for those uh, big hitters and big punches when they come. Um, there's no way of predicting it. Um, Obviously, uh, we'd like to think uh, in this rolling crisis period that uh, at any point anything can happen, and that's that's certainly the case. Uh, but you can prepare. You can you can prepare for um, a certain scenario that you think is is likely, and and prepare um, uh, trades that you think you would you would uh, you would execute at certain levels, or no matter what, or you know what hedges you would put on in your in your current book, or which positions you would cut. I think. You, you can mentally prepare for those stress scenarios without then having to endure it uh, when uh, obviously you know emotions are going to be 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 flying high especially when when something happens and uh, there's only as much as you can prepare obviously for it you, there's there's other constraints that you will not be able to um, um, to have a workaround and uh, this is obviously where where learning will uh, um, uh, the learning process will kick in but uh, yeah it, it's about really allocation of of that uh, mental mental capital for those times and then prepare for it. Like like this year, you know, I, I also anticipated uh, a slowdown of the economy and only now in, in, in the ex post world, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can with Harry hindsight uh, quite confidently as usual say, you know, I can see why, why normal and, and just real growth was actually holding in very well given given you know this deficit spending um and the consumer and you know we, we live in a normal world but right? it's not the real real world um how you know profit margins are still uh holding in relatively well uh, despite uh, this inflationary regime we're in not for everyone but yeah for, for a lot of companies especially in the, in the tech side right so um and with that as well how how liquidity shapes all those things and and again, despite me thinking I, I I've seen a few things and learned a few things, you there's always something new to be to be considering. And one of those elements, maybe if I can just um, finish off on this, uh, was the whole thinking about how uh, basically we had uh, we had a liquidity injection through QE, but that hasn't really hasn't really uh, gone into the real world. But right? it went into financial markets, but not into into um, into the real world through fiscal spending, and and how how now basically uh, you know once the once the Federal Reserve or the Treasury now is issuing bonds, this bond is then being bought by uh, the cash reserves that are sitting at the reverse repo, buying that bond and then financing basically uh, going into checks into people's accounts, corporates' accounts is being spent by fiscal deficit. How this is extremely expansionary, right? Um, and you could you could argue that, um, and that's just a scenario. It's not my base case. How this is actually ultimately another massive inflationary impulse, right? <laughs> Despite inflation inflation trending down, right. but as we as we knew when when twenty twenty happened, once you had monetary expansion of twenty five percent, I mean, my first thought was, I mean, I'm a little bit of a monetarist, is that inflation at some point needs to pick up. I didn't envisage it uh, to to be as, as sharp as it did but you know two years later we were there so knowing the lags roughly i mean you could envisage a scenario where we're 
on hold, but then similar to what the Canadians in a mini in a mini uh, episode had to do uh, from going from pause to now looking at hiking again because inflation spiked uh, too too much in August. That inflation is going to be picking up again right? at some right. point next year. I think that that's a totally feasible scenario. So I'm uh, I'm working around those elements and and just thinking in different time frames how I would be investing uh, for such a scenario unfolding. But yeah, uh, very tricky, of course, and that's what macro is about. But yeah, getting the timing right. Um, if you're if you're too early, you're wrong, of course, because uh, yeah. you need to you need to you need to get that uh, timing right. But you you can see scenarios and have a timeline of what needs to happen in between then and what you will do i think that is um, that is preparing you for the script and to be executing efficiently when the time comes hopefully yeah it's interesting to think about uh, it's cool to to play out these scenarios because uh, ultimately we don't really as an individual allocator or trader have any control over that we only have control of like where we're putting our own capital and why and uh yeah you know, it's like, that's, that's why I'm doing this is, is to, you know, these we're, we're talking about me and you, but really we're talking about everybody, right? It's like, you have to start asking yourself these questions, which I'm always asking myself. Um, cause I'm, st I'm starting to think a little bit more long-term and so far I'm really struggling with that because I'm such a short-term guy. Um, so to, to think six, 12, 18 months ahead really boggles my mind because I just feel like everything changes within a month or two every month or two um and like when i think of a scenario like let's say uh you know that they they do keep spending or whatever but inflation doesn't have that second um pickup right and then inflation does fall to to two percent or one and a half percent and all they've done is spend money doesn't that just reassure the them that oh spending even more money will not actually create inflation so we're going to keep doing it but then there's this um mindset of people who invest with money who says well if you keep doing it we're going to increase our expectations of what we think inflation will be even if the actuality of it is going to different like so then you have like that that dichotomy again of like the actual market forces and then like the expectation of people, which I guess is the whole fight between like bonds and stocks and everything. Right. It's just like, to me, it, it, it blows my mind, uh, the possibilities. So somebody like you, like you and capital flows who I talked to and stuff like that, like you're pretty good at being like, yeah, I get it. it, it this all could happen. But for what we know right now, this is what we think probabilistically is going to be the best, like the best outlook here in the next 12 to 18 months or something like that. Yeah, precisely. And I mean, I can see how um, if you're if you're really trading very short term, uh, you know, it gives you shivers thinking about the next six months because inherently, I mean, that's that's true for everything. It's it, it's unforecastable. Right? The market is obviously a forward looking um, discounting mechanism, and it tries to anticipate on average what what everyone's what everyone's view is uh, on as a on balance, right? And it gives you a pricing. Um, and that's why also, you know, I don't, I'm not sure whether you've come around these, these charts of bond markets being wrong over time, right? These, um, you know, what the market is forecasting um, as a probability going forward, but precisely that, because it's not a, it's not a black or white, uh, right or wrong uh, discounting mechanism. Markets are probabilistic. So how I said that market is now looking at what, 50% probability of the Fed going um, twice this year. It's going to be hundred percent wrong, right? Because yeah. either yeah. they either either they're going to go go or not. But it's a it's a weighted average, and that's why short ends are actually quite quite uh, nice to look at because you can derive those uh, market implied probabilities. Uh, but it's going to be wrong by definition. But that you need a market, right? The market is not going to be uh, zero or hundred. It has to be somewhere in between for buyers and sellers to meet, right? So, uh, and that is what uh, what what is fascinating about markets. But the further out you go, you have this obviously more uncertainty premia um, uh, to be building in a risk premia etc um, and that's why you know that's why you could argue again with the recency bias the bond market has been anticipating rates to roll over for this to move into into obviously a recession not a not a not a, a recession such such as 2008 and 9 
but uh, definitely a, a more more than a severe recession as, as we priced only a few months ago, right? Now, obviously, uh, a lot of those rate cuts have been priced out. Um, at the at the top, I believe we were at one seventy five in a on a one year forward basis um, in terms of rate cuts priced, and then shortly after, obviously the the small banking failures in in March. But if you compare this to what uh, 08, for example, was pricing was uh, two hundred twenty five. So we were mm-hmm. we were uh, only fifty basis points away from a uh, 08 type of scenario uh, back in March and and uh, and April, right? Which is which is too extreme given what we know. Yes, of course, banks failed, smaller banks, but you know, contagion, QE, all the quick um, quick fire facilities that were put in place by uh, by the Fed to to avoid further contagion. Obviously, you know, um, over in Europe, uh, they pressurized they pressurized Credit Suisse uh, to surrender itself to its uh, largest competitor for for uh, for a century plus. So. Uh, you know, all these effects obviously had uh, had a massive liquidity injection uh, at the end of it, right? which um, um, which obviously boosted markets. Right, so that is that is the, the that is always the uh, the comparison versus the past is useful, but uh, uh, it also gives you a sense of what is what is probable and what is not. And to me, you know, what was priced in, and to some extent, you could argue, uh, still it's somewhat unattractive. Um, in terms of um, rate cuts pricing for next year, I think we're at currently at what eighty basis points or so. Um, that's that's still it's getting better, but it's still mm-hmm. not uh, super enticing to be loading the bond, the bonds, right? And um, to that note as well, I just um, I'll briefly briefly say that, and then obviously uh, stop because I'm yapping on. Um, okay. If you've seen the table that I've that I put out today from a piece last year that I wrote about when to buy bonds, the the bulk of the returns in bonds come when the Fed starts cutting rates. I think 85% of all returns and excess returns, historically, of course, massive asterisk, um, have been have been banked from first rate cut to the end of the end of the um, easing cycle. So <clears throat> if you know those odds, right, and you take them for given, which is a big if, uh, why would you load the Low bonds when you you haven't even given a signal yet that we're over in terms of rate rate hikes. Um, that is uh, you know just just something to be uh, thinking about and definitely uh, something that I keep in mind and also also put me at ease not to be front loading too quickly and too jumping too quickly on the on the bond wagon because yields are attractive. I get I I, I get that, but um, there's still a lot of money to be made if uh, if and when they start uh, really. Uh, first talking about easing rates and then obviously uh, acting upon it. Yeah. And when I hear you say that my instinct as a short-term trader, and I think this, this goes back to what we were talking about before about time horizon and experience is that when you say, why would you be loading the boat on bonds? I'm like, cause it's going to happen before it happens, right? Like I'm going to miss, <laughs> this is the time to be averaging in and like, um, you know, by the time they actually make that first cut, I'll have lost out on whatever, you know, whatever gain it may be. But in the meantime, you're just, you know, as what's happening now, um, you're just getting off sides and, and getting more pressured and pressured. And, and now what I'm starting to get convinced of is the possibility of, I mean, there could be some sort of weird capitulatory move in there as well. Like maybe not, but like, yes, if, yeah. if everybody is, you know, really loading the boat and then convinced, like I, I heard something, I don't remember where I heard it, but there's often some sort of credit event or whatever in which yields before they fall, they spike. And if that were to occur, it might spike in a fashion that really could rack a lot of people before actually resuming a downward yield. Um, and I might be wrong on that. It's just something I heard. But what what are your thoughts on? Uh, I know we're getting into just market talk at this point, but like, um, am I in the realm of of generally what what is even po- what's possible there? And I, so I think FOMO plays a part in this whole thing um, when it comes to entering the bond trade now. And you, with the experience and longer term time horizon, are able to be okay with that more than maybe a newer investor. Right. Because you're like, look, I've seen this kind of play out a few times. And if I were to 
miss the first move in bonds, whatever, it doesn't matter. This is a multi-year um, potential idea. I don't need to be first in averaging down just because I think something could happen. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, let's dissect this um, in a, in a few steps, if I if I may. Um, sorry, on your, on your first point. Sorry, what was what was the? Yeah, sorry, I don't know. We just keep, what... we just keep throwing like ten points at each other. So I, I don't know. No, it's sure. cool. It's cool. <laughs> it's like a it's a it's a proper dodgeball game. I like that. You know. Uh, the first point would probably be that like, um, the the feeling I get when you say. Uh, talk about the bond trade is like I want to FOMO in and be first because I'm a short term guy, right? Um, yeah, I I don't want to miss that first move when it's so obvious that like a rate cut is coming in that bonds could go up. Um, whereas sure. you're coming at it from like the opposite end of like why even bother now? Um, because you're probably okay with not being first or whatever with a long term yes. more investment. Yes, yeah. Sorry, there was another question on on whether. Um, and and I saw I think the same research that that says exactly bond spikes or bear steepening as we have so bear steepening meaning bond yields are rising with long dated yields rising higher than short end yields um, that this is usually the the necessary one of the actual necessary ingredients that then precursors a fall in bond yields and a bull steepening which then means that short end rates are rallying faster than longer end yields. For this to happen, for a bull steepening to happen, however, you need the Fed to roll over, right? They need to, I mean, mechanically, they need to start cutting rates for this to materialize. And so far, obviously, that's that's not happening. Um, and I think there's a bit of a reflexivity of this, like, you know, uh, for, for a big, uh, I mean, I, I think in equities or in commodities, you see that too, for, uh, for uh, a big rally to resume, you need a washout or you need this, psychological, you know, destructive phase of something uh, yeah. breaking before it can resume uh, an upward trend. And in bonds, obviously, you could argue um, it has a self-reinforcing reflexive nature in that higher bond yields and steeper curves ultimately will break something somewhere in the system, then necessitating, obviously, for those bonds to, to, uh, to come back and then, and then uh, save the system from, its, from itself, if that makes sense. So there's a there's obviously a reversal mechanism in that, um, and it speaks to it speaks to obviously in a strategy where you uh, do you want to start investing now? And 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 I had some comments in my DMs as well. Does it does it make sense to dollar cost average over time in bonds, given they also have you know carry if you're uh, if you already fund it right? If you don't need to borrow money to buy bonds, they obviously will will give you positive carry. Uh, does it make sense to to do that? And I think that, that's that's right. It it just it just matters how you size it. I, I don't know how you personally uh, size um, your positions. Whether that's a uniform, or do you just have one one risk unit, um, which I call a, a sort of a, a step into into investing? Uh, how I do it um, is to to start with my minimum size, regardless of what it is and my conviction is. I always start with the minimum size. Um, I would not normally add when it goes against me. I'd, I'd rather be stopping out. But what I do, and I think that's that's uh, the general macro playbook, I guess, if you read any books of Soros and, and Druckenmiller, et cetera, once it starts moving in their, in their, in their direction um, and you get this confirmation of, of, uh, of your thesis to be working out by prices moving in your favor, in your favor that's when they add to, their, to the positions and max it out, right? Just to kill the kill the market. So in that in that regard, if your scenario is really that we will, uh, which is totally also likely, I would not say my base, but probably one of my higher probability scenarios is um, that normally after after two years of rate tax, etc., and we're getting there um, uh, closer into time, something historically is always uh, broken in that. Uh, the Fed had an excuse then to to uh, lower rates at some point, right? So, uh, with that scenario in mind, it absolutely makes sense to to at least in the in the fourth quarter start um, start buying bonds if you if that's really uh, what you think. Um, but where on the curve would you buy? Why would you buy uh, longer dated bonds, right? Which are extremely volatile still. Um, they obviously have also the highest interest rate risk, but uh, short dated bonds. 
give you a positive carry, but they're also um, you know less volatile and bonds would need to sell off quite a bit for you to have a zero return, right? And, and hence also my, I don't know whether you've seen my piece that um, for a long time, like uh, two-year bonds to, to, to lose on a rolling 12 months basis uh, to, to be underwater is extremely rare, right? I mean, one of them rare events obviously happened over the last uh, 12 months, but uh, given that we went from zero, basically you have no carry, you have no buffer to absorb capital losses, to now going above five percent, uh, you know, you you can you can summon quite a bit of more rate rises before you start losing money. So, uh, if you're looking, and that's by no means an investment advice, but also something that that I've been looking at, if you're looking to slowly uh, put your feet into the pool, I would start at the shorter end and then work work out as as bonds uh, bonds continue selling off. But that's uh, that's sort of uh, something that I would I'll be looking at. But again. Uh, given given that I know that the fat that the fat pitch again is at the other side of of this uh, rate hiking cycle, i.e., when they roll over and start talking about easing and then ultimately implementing it, I would I would uh, reserve quite a lot of risk capital for the time when it comes because, as I highlighted in that small example of the table, at least historically, quite a big chunk of returns are still available to you uh, once they start easing. And um, mm-hmm. why not? You know, I'm happy to miss part of that trade but yeah other people other people might not be enticing uh, might might not be uh, i don't know enticed to to jump on a on a on a moving uh, wagon but in macro i think that's uh, that's the bread and butter of, of making money right you need to you need to make sure that you that you catch the bulk of a move um and uh, and they come often actually they come more often than you think so it's just about being patient and then having the having the grit and the process in place to to pile onto those positions when you when you when you see them forming, how do you how do you go about those things? Just out of curiosity, um, I'll, I'll answer that. Just to tack on your point, I just wanted to get this thought out. It's like when I hear you say that, I I think of like a bigger problem in just today how everything operates today is like how do you get that mindset into the general twenty to forty year old male investor right because like we're like this comes back to like we need it now like the system's rigged i have very few opportunities so like when i see it i need to take it you know it just seems antithetical to the whole like you need to be patient waiting for fat pitches like it's hard to like tie those two things together and i think having conversations like this like really you know could maybe take people could take a step back and really try to see the bigger picture and it's cool to have people like you out there spreading that. Um, but I just feel like there's this huge gap, you know, and I can see it because I feel it as a short term trader. I, f- I feel it. I'm involved in crypto. Like I understand like um, the need and the want for things now. Um, still something I, I struggle with. But like there's this, you know, there's this huge, uh, especially for people without that much capital that really like see people winning so much money you know they're just like chomping at the bit to like risk capital to make a ton of money um and to be to be disciplined enough like even when you say like putting in a minimum and not adding to it when it goes against you even though theoretically maybe your idea is getting even better and better and to wait for it to like be going in your favor to add uh that's just tough to do you know um I, I, I haven't personally operated that way. No, like when, when I think of how I approach trades, I'm usually like, uh, I trade futures. So like I'm long, short, whatever. And when I do it, I try to like go hard and fast, right? I try to be, um, I talk about this in other podcasts. I try to be like first or third. I want to be like first in the trade to where I'm getting, like, I kind of have it planned out and like my target hits and I'm just, I'm just going for it. Um, or I'm going to like see a target get hit. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to like, maybe, maybe I had a level or something or an order that I was like looking at. It comes, it it doesn't exactly get to where I, I want. So I don't go first, but then I don't chase it. I wait for it to kind of come back to that entry again. And then I'll be third and I'll be okay with taking it there. Um, but I try to never be second because second, oh, there's, so many that's a whole nother conversation but being second is like the worst um 
but that's how I approach things. So for me, it's a little bit, it's, it's the opposite mindset in which like, I, I'm like a, a guy that wants to be swinging at a lot of first pitches and like trying to get ahead of the count and, and stuff like that. Whereas it seems like you're the guy who's like a really, really tough out in baseball, who's going to take a lot of balls, follow a lot of pitches off. And then like, once you finally understand the pitcher, you're going to exactly know when the fastball is coming. You know what I'm saying? Does that analogy make sense at all? Yes, absolutely. Although obviously that those, those fat pitches sometimes don't come and then you miss hit them, right? Which is the biggest risk and probably the, the highest opportunity risk to your scenario when you're more engaging and more active. Uh, to me, it's also a function of, obviously you're, and as we, as we talked, it's a, it's a personal journey, right? We're all on uh, certain things work for you. They might not work for me and vice versa. And that's totally, that's totally cool with me. I mean, I think there's also a little bit and coming from the institutional world, there's a bit of arrogance towards believing that you can't make money on, on shorter term timeframes. Totally. Uh, I mean, unproven, right? And it's, uh, and it's totally, it's totally doable. Uh, to me, it's also an allocation of time. Um, I'm obviously investing my own money. I, I have another few things uh, um, on the plate that I'm, that I'm dealing with mostly on the philanthropic side. Um, but also, obviously, I'm, I'm writing, uh, which I really enjoy actually on paper author. Um, but yes, it, it really is about your focus, um, your, your determination, but also your, your uh, aversion to risk and how you, how you like to, to roll um, ultimately. I don't know whether you know the, uh, the story of the Phantom Gambler, uh, a famous uh, a dude that, that rocked up in, uh, uh, in Vegas in the 80s. And he would basically, um, he would basically have, a, have a whole case of money and uh, it would just be purely intuitive. He, he would know, he would, he would book himself into a motel uh, and just wait it out and then just go to the same casino and nothing dodgy about it, nothing, you know, car counting wise and just would put everything on either uh, black or black or red. And uh, in the, in the bag, or in this case, he would also have a pill of cyanide or whatever, in case he loses it all, he would just kill himself. You know, this is the ultimate risk taking. And I know it's a bit morbid, but uh, I mean, you, you could, you could guess, I will not have to tell you how this whole uh, story ended, but he had, he had some, some home runs, of course, to start off with. And, you know, is that a is that a viable strategy? I mean, uh, aside from obviously uh, the, the the little pill at the end, but um, yes, I mean, yes, I mean by all means. But I, I think all the literature and common sense, etc., if you want to create overall generational wealth, would would go against it, right? Time is quite a critical factor in compounding, but it's also um, the sort of noise to signal ratio is also extremely high in shorter term time frames. Um, talking about models, my model is obviously a daily model that is um, uh, that is uh, giving me signals on a on a on a daily basis. Uh, I, I've created uh, shorter term time time frame models, which are which are great. But uh, I'm actually in the process of trying to. Uh, I don't have time to look at it. I'm I'm trying to uh, program it fully um, and have it executed uh, pretty much automatically. Um, yes, absolutely. There's patterns that you can uh, that you can uh, make money mo money of in any sort of uh, environment and, and any sort of uh, um, anything that moves, basically, of course. But uh, yeah, my my style is more to, I guess, uh, predominantly to look at these, yeah, fat pitches indeed. But I also run these uh, daily models that are purely technical. They they don't give a fuck about. Yeah. Um, sorry about uh, the F word here, but uh, they don't care about uh, you know where the economy is going, whether the Fed is hiking tomorrow or not. If there's a signal, they just go. And I think there's something refreshing about it because um, uh, systematizing your own view is uh, is great, and the process that drives on those things obviously has a has usually a short time frame before this alpha um, disappears. Uh, but it's it's something nice to have as a as a as a, a sort of um, adjacent strategy to overall macro thing, because it will highlight me certain events that I haven't thought about. Um, so combining combining a portfolio with longer term and shorter term time time frames is actually quite a useful diversifier, especially uh, over the last ten years or so, because volatility was so damn low, right? You couldn't yeah. 
you couldn't wait. The fat pitches actually in macro in macro land uh, almost never arrived. Right? Aside from, you know, you had the sovereign, you had the sovereign um, um, sovereign crisis in Europe in 2010 to 2012, and then you had um, um, almost 2013 was obviously this whole uh, tapering um, a scenario shenanigans, and then everyone waiting for a prolonged time for the first rate hike that then came in December 2015. So not many things that were happening. So you have to rely on shorter term time frames. It really matters what regime you're in. And that's why in my process, I don't know how, how yours obviously is way more shorter term. My process always starts in, in trying to find out in which regime you're in, because that will determine, determine quite, a, quite a big chunk on how you allocate best and what strategies work and which don't. Um, obviously, you have to be right on, on determining which uh, regime you're in, but you know you you have a lot of historical uh, data available, uh, also a lot of them free, into analyzing how 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 where you, where you're finding yourself and what uh, what investments are are the best to be to be striking in in such an environment. And that's why, to some extent, yeah. Again, with hindsight, last year was a bit easier because you could see. You know, rate hikes are coming. They're going to hike more. Inflation is getting a little bit out of hand. You just look at the playbooks, the average playbook of the 70s, 80s, uh, I think the late 40s, 50s. And you could you could see what, what usually works, right? Like commodities work in such a scenario. You shouldn't be investing in bonds. Uh, equities, uh, to some extent, uh, will take a hit uh, first off, but then but then, uh, uh, you know, the value value equities should do well in such a scenario. Um, and then you're you're getting into the later stage in a convoluted way, like this year is to some extent, that is a little bit trickier to to make money of. And it it, it shows immediately also in in P and L. As I said, I'm I'm small up for the year, nothing to boast about, but um, I'll be behind my uh, sort of uh, annual target that I set myself. But uh, you know, it's it's okay given. That this is quite a big, uh, big noisy year, right? With a lot of yeah. false stars. We had like one crisis, which was an opportunity, actually. Um, always is, um, and obviously uh, an equity market that uh, that at least if you look at uh, some data on mutual flows, is uh, is still dumbfounding some people because of its strength, right? So people yeah. are underweight generally and have missed uh, missed on those uh, uh, baggers, multi baggers for this year. So yeah. Uh, so yes, a very very interesting year, but uh, the next one should be even even more interesting. I think that's that's when we're gonna probably go back into the good old macro book where you will hopefully have more prolonged um, uh, momentum um, and some 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 good fat pictures coming up, hopefully. But yeah, well, it's not like um, there's I'm anything preparing. interesting. There's nothing interesting coming in 2024, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Zero. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and as I said, um, yeah, we're running into uh, obviously an election year over there where you are. Um, yep. So uh, you know, budget budget is uh, projected to be between one and a half to what two trillion. Um, yep. We're obviously going to pump that. Meanwhile, over the next two years, we'll have to raise three trillion of uh, of bonds have to be issued and. And another three three trillion just to offset some of the maturing bonds. Um, mm -hmm. So who's going to buy that? That's obviously everyone's question now. I mean, you know, the demand demand will be found at points when there's uh, attractive yields to be to be uh, to be found. And you know, coming from an institutional um, background, I can tell you. I mean, those people have been piling into bonds for uh, for most of this year, right? Um, yeah. And and they haven't seen those yields for ten plus years, you know. So these pension funds, especially in Europe, that were buying negatively yielding uh, uh, bonds not too long ago, they'll be, you know, um, uh, they will be uh, very happy to be to be piling in uh, with any additional money that comes into their doors. So there is demand, uh, of course. While hedge funds are still short, um, and obviously. The global picture, uh, central bank res reserves and, and managers are probably awaiting better yields um, to be piling in. And if they're buying, they're buying in the short end, not in the long end. And there you, there you go. You, you're suddenly moving um, from T-bills, issuing T-bills that are basically being financed by the reverse repo facility into issuing coupons. And I think that's what obviously I call the bond markets uh, 
uh, massively offside uh, over the last uh, six weeks or so since, since yeah. the announcement, announcement at the beginning of August and took uh, equities initially with it. And now uh, equities again are looking more vulnerable given given this uh, renewed fear about where where bonds or where rates ultimately will end up. Uh, we don't know, but uh, there's a few scenarios while liquidity uh, change in, in marginal liquidity looks set to decrease in two year end as far as I'm concerned. So uh, there you go. That is the overall picture as to as to the fourth quarter, which which I hope will be a positive one for, for both you and I, my friend. Oh, yeah, it will be. We're, we're going to crush it. And, uh, you know, paper alpha, they're going to oh. just uh, load the boat with bonds. The, America doesn't have to worry about it. We got a buyer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's it when you... Well, yes. um, Sorry, you can finish your thought, and then I have, I'll go back to a question. No, no, I, I, I have many other thoughts. I, I, I tend to ramble on, and but you are the speaker of of uh, of your your podcast, so hey, that's why we bring the guests your... on. We just suck it all out of you, and then we 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 use you for all you've got, and then we we go do our <laughs> own thing. No, what, what was interesting to me though is the fact that you started. I, I almost want to call it like a paper algo that you're kind of. Uh, developing for more short short term stuff, but that when I hear you say that, I'm like, why, right? Like if if things have been, you know, you've kind of done things a certain way a long time. Like, what is what's driving you to do that? Is it is it almost like what we were talking about before, where you're you're like you're seeing more short term opportunity, so you're you're looking for ways to capture that, um, or are you bored, or like what's the what's the drive behind? <laughs> going shorter and shorter and you know as i look to go longer and longer uh well very short is the uh, the never-ending quest in what we do that you always need to expand your horizon to learn I, I guess the moment that i will stop thinking that i that i'm that i have arrived to some uh investment nirvana is the moment i'm probably going to lose a lot of money so to me it's always being prepared to what's next to come and it's just, uh, I guess, to keep myself, um, you know, interested in, in new aspects. I mean, uh, again, I think there's a certain arrogance that comes uh, from the investment world and the institutional investment world that, you know, you have, you're sitting on billions, investing billions, et cetera. That's great. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, making money um, doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't, you know, you can be a good trader with only a million on their assets. Uh, rather than a few billion, but uh, to me, it's just a request to to test myself. But also, something that I've started to learn a little bit is, uh, you know, programming in Python. I, I haven't programmed in a while, so that's mm -hmm. also keeping me busy in terms of just learning and and, and finding new things. And and heck, what if I find a really good uh, alpha stream that has way better sharps than my longer term trades? Why not? I mean. You know the the big the big algo hedge funds like uh, Rentec etc. They constantly are adding new alpha streams to their portfolio because they know that the that the ones that they currently employ have a have a ever shortening actually ever shortening uh, lifespan, and that's coming with obviously you know a little bit of um, of uh, uh, more and more intelligent people, more and more uh, you know very very uh, smart people uh, programming. Um, programming capabilities in Python, et cetera, data being free, freely available and, and spotting more trends and alpha sources. So I think uh, there's there's definitely um, there's definitely more opportunities that I've previously not properly looked at that are in the shorter term timeframes that I'm happy to look at now. And you know, uh, it keeps me it keeps me engaged and, and also something uh, something that I quite like doing is keep a uh, you know, keep the pulse in the market. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yes, I can have a view over the next six months. I put the trade on and not think about it. But I think you you lose a lot of, um, you know, the, it's important to stay at the beat of the market. And maybe also to this is exactly my point that you actually never stop thinking about what markets do and uh, and where the next trade is. But it, it really keeps me, keeps me busy and on, on the toes while hopefully... <laughs> hopefully finding another uh, uh, profitable source of alpha uh, down the line. So yeah, that's, that's the whole rationale in a, in a nutshell for you. That's cool. That's inspiring for uh, somebody who's, you know, been in it so long, you know, you haven't, re I don't feel like I've reached burnout. I've, I feel like I've 
I've been frustrated or whatever of late, but it's, it's never ceases to amaze me how interesting it is. And like we talked about earlier, it's, it's the most like free job. That's not free at all. You know, like, or the most freedom you could have without having any freedom ever, you know, it's a, you're always kind of somehow engaged. You're never, you're never fully away from it. But once you, once you're in, man, it's, uh, it's hard to step away from it, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's obviously the cost. There's a cost of freedom to mm-hmm. any freedom. And that's years off the end of your life in this case. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yes. All right. So, so yeah. we'll wrap this up. This, uh, this was a, a great conversation, but just to touch on kind of what we were saying, um, do you think there's anything obvious that people these days, um, you know, maybe in that cohort of people we were talking about are doing incorrectly, eh, you know, whether something's correct or incorrect is, is vague, but like, are there, are there any obvious mistakes people are making these days, uh, information overload, over trading, chasing too much, risking too much, things like that. Um, and how do you best think people approach fixing some of these problems? So what, what do you think you see out there um, since you're, you know, in that, that world of X and all those smart people? <laughs> um, <clears throat> it would be, it, it would be incredibly arrogant for me to say, you know, what is, what is right for now. I'm no arbiter yeah. of, of, of truth. Uh, and I, and I say this in the most humble way possible because, you know, I am, what, what tell, I mean, yes, your PNL is ultimately the arbiter of truth, but how is that being derived is uh, obviously another one. I mean, you could have done better. There's always obviously a multitude of parallel universes out there that that uh, you could do better or worse. Than, right? So um, I would say, I would say yes. A lot of the the usual suspects like over trading, like um, um, etc., will will obviously be an indication, and ultimately your PNL that something is not right. Um, uh, what what do I see? I mean, again, I, I I have a few people actually who have reached out to me and I'm um, sort of mentoring them as well a little bit on that side. Um, I take it in, 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 in insanely um, uh, serious, that, that part, because that's when you really delve into somebody's, you know, background, psychology, et cetera, the, the frustration that go into, into, into those things. And I've felt all of those things throughout my career. And, you know, I'm still struggling with a lot of elements. So, if that's a if that's a freshening for other people to hear, so be it. I I do beat myself up as well on missed opportunities or 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 wrongly sizing things or not not properly going full in when I should should have. All those things are very very uh, human uh, human things. I think the biggest the biggest mistake probably is um, not to do your research uh, properly and just believing uh, anything that you read. So I would say you know primary research. Plus, having a good sense of a little bit of skepticism, skepticism, especially you know in this world of X, as you say, um, to to really look at um, um, a problem for more multifaceted ways, and that's something I call and I and I put it out there as well. I, I call it mosaic theory. Personally, I mean, mm-hmm. I have one vantage point of looking at the world, but by no means I will be extremely arrogant and thinking this is the right way, right? But what I've done over time is to have trusted resources of people, uh, also in X, by the way, uh, but also mostly my colleagues and network that I know that that look at the world from different angles and vantage points. And it's quite important to to you know to feel what they're looking at and maybe the, what I'm what I'm missing. So it's it's if I could if I could summarize it, maybe one thing is not only looking at at your uh, all, everything that you know or you think you know but especially moving out of that comfort zone a bit and look at the blind spots and, and check out things either educationally, and that's why I'm big on education and they're all free on my on, on paper alpha, um, educationally, or just in terms of certain other aspects of the markets that you haven't uh, haven't uh, noticed. And, uh, and to much to my astonishment, I, I find those things quite often for myself yeah. too. So it's a never ending process. And and I think something that we touched on, I don't know whether you hit on the um, record button then, is uh, have some skin in the game. Everything, you know, reading about, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a survivorship bias. Yes, we can all read about successful investors and 
you will see people on TikTok or whatever with fancy cars and all those things. That's all great. Uh, copying somebody else is usually a very bad idea. Um, yeah. It's it's finding who who you are, how you act, how you invest. It's a very personal journey, and that's why journeys are are insanely dif- different, right? I like to compile my my capital on you know predictable good good uh, uh, good growth rates over years. I cannot say somebody's totally stupid for you know going to, going to this casino and and betting. Well, I wouldn't do it, but because that's not my risk profile. But if you're if you're like all or nothing um, um, a person in terms of investing, you know, so be it. But be be aware that your time um, that your time with this capital might be rather short lived, right? So it it really matters, and you need to find out. You can only find out about yourself, um, and that's why I'm saying when I'm mentioning people, I I really go deep into analyzing where on the spectrum they are in terms of risk aversion, et cetera, and how, what, what kind of risk profile are. If you don't know where you are, it's going to be very hard to, to find a way out of it. So um, how you start that is obviously by, by starting small, by starting nimbly, by educating yourself. And, and that, that will always, over time, lead to, uh, lead to at least the answer of knowing who the fuck you are. And then hopefully the returns will follow. But um, you know, the first cut is the deepest, as my, my first boss told me. So <laughs> losing money is just part of the game. Um, and it will it will strengthen you like hormesis and all those uh, the ice baths that you hopefully hopefully not taking. I, I never had the balls to do it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm know, too much of a boss to do it. Okay, I, I will do I will do that um, uh, when I next time see you. But um, uh, all those things, you know, to strengthen you. And uh, there's only one way, and that's uh, that's pers- it's very personal to you. Um, but you have to go through it. Uh, without that, I, I guess the mistakes will just compound over time because if you're not willing to learn and put the shift in into this journey, into yourself and your style, how you invest, you will never find out. And it, and it would sound like I'm, I'm speaking to a, to a guy who has discovered uh, very quickly uh, his um, affinity to markets and, uh, you know, uh, hats off to you because you are obviously prepared to, do, to go to those dark corners in your in yourself and, and find out um, uh, what you're good at and what you're not good at and then ultimately execute on it. Um, but again, not, it's not for everyone, but uh, if you're not willing to go that hard, um, hard journey, then I think it's going to be rather a tough one um, because this is a highly complex and competitive market. You know, you're, uh, it's a zero sum game in terms of trading for sure. Um, so, you know, also know what your competitors are doing and, and how they're approaching markets. Um, so yes, be be curious, be nimble, and uh, and and going for it uh, has never harmed anyone. Um, and you know, if you can build resilience over time, and and obviously not burn throughout your capital, I think you you'll be on the winning end ultimately. Um, it has worked for me. It has worked for many people I've observed. I've also observed for people that it hasn't worked for, and and investing is not for them. And then you have to just, you know, be honest to yourself and uh, and outsource it. Right? That's why a lot of people actually, uh, I, I know uh, a lot of uh, business entrepreneurs, etc. They have no, they, they don't want to talk about finance. They actually are very happy to pay somebody a fee to invest for them because they, mm-hmm. they have to deal with multitude of other things. And with that, actually, which is quite ironic as well, you have, quite a big group of um, very wealthy investors who are happy not to invest um, their own personal wealth. Well, they, they have it in their funds or whatever, but uh, some investors are actually also outsourcing it just for diversification purposes. They want to lose both their personal wealth and their right. clients' uh, clients' wealth for obvious reasons. Um, so they're, they're happy to diversify it and give it away to other people because they can't stand uh, the pressure on both ends, I guess. So. Mm. Anyway, I hope that answered some question. But again, um, um, these are some inputs. What is wrong? What is right? Uh, is is very hard for me to judge. But I think uh, I, I made a, I made a few points, strong points, clear on on where I stand in terms of how you should approach it and and, uh, and uh, how this is all a very individual journey. And uh, best of luck to you if you if you try for it. Oh, what a mic drop moment, folks! Jeez, just lay, laying down all the alpha right there um that was that was great we'll we'll uh we'll wrap it up here is there any um 
Anybody you want to give a shout out on Twitter or X to anything you want to talk about your uh, paper alpha, your, um, your offering stuff like that, just in case people are interested in following you. Um, well, you can, you can find me, um, on, I still call it Twitter. What do you call it? I, I don't know. I'm, Twitter, I'm like right? half, I'm X half is strange. Half. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter X, um, under, uh, you know, paper underscore alpha, A-L-F-A, um, or at paperalpha.com, which is a uh, Substack linked. Um, shout out to obviously everyone who has, uh, who, you know, has helped me and inspired me on this, uh, on this, on this journey and this, you know, this ultimate network um, and leverage. I think that that is the exciting part. I mean, up until recently, you obviously had uh, almost unlimited uh leverage opportunity financially given that where rates were uh, close to zero um but you know this networking and this sharing of ideas and and you know this collaborative effort is is really something that's inspiring and and uh, somebody who's obviously helped me a lot this uh, uh global flows your uh your uh, your friend on the other side um he's been he's been very good uh, very thorough and uh, and you know very very uh very interesting aspects of uh, how he thinks, um, both on his Twitter and his uh, and his Substack. Um, there's obviously, I mean, you know, I'm um, I'm part of the uh, also the the community and on Twitter um, around Kitty, etc. It's a it's a it's a great network of people that are just you know sharing ideas, you know, coming together and uh, yeah, the cats, um, you know, and uh, you know. While uh, uh, you know, <laughs> while, while it's a close community, I still think it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a very, very useful and uh, very inspiring, and always something new to learn environment there. So yeah, some shout out to the cats, um, and you know, I'm uh, I'm meeting uh, and and through that yeah net networking effect, quite a quite a few new people, including yeah. you, by the way, which is. Uh, to me, also been a very inspiring chat. So thank you for inviting me to this thing. Um, there is a is a gentleman as well that I will probably launch my first spaces with, uh, called the Alchemist Investor. Um, uh -huh. And it's just it's just something that, that I uh, mentioned. You know, in terms of mosaic theory, he comes from a equity background, mostly in you know compounder growth equities. Something that is that is basically as a fixed income macro guy, the total opposite of your investment side. Where we are thinking about shortfall risk, how to mitigate and, not, and be a bit more paranoid about uh, losses, etc. Well, well, he is more into you know multi bagger investing. Uh, but you know, from a prof professional angle, he's a he's a you know works with a hedge fund, um, you know, few billions on the management. It, it would seem so. Uh, that's that's something that that. Uh, um, I got to know him a little bit, so shout out to him and uh, yeah, watch out for the spaces that we're uh, hopefully going to launch soon, where we basically going to dissect a little bit the different styles of investment, uh, the macro versus the versus this uh, sort of growth growth and uh, you know um, uh, you know ten x type of uh, investment styles that are out there. Obviously, that's also doable in macro, given uh, that you can take leverage, but uh, generally not uh, not the not the uh, the realm to be to be uh, um, investing in such a you know such a high multiple capacity but yeah that's something um, something that I'm really much looking forward to so yeah thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, to conversate and again I'm taking away a lot of things that you've um, mentioned today for myself so uh, thank you very very great, great. oh that'll be cool once you guys get that space is running you'll get the perfect soup between the uh the macro the the growth the, you're gonna find the perfect spots for us all to invest and not have to do any work ourselves and we'll just copy paste just like we were saying and it should all work out in the end yes it's probably cash right <laughs> rolling rolling it's us dollars cash at five percent baby that's, <laughs> that's the right. best way forward you know yeah. uh but yes yeah i'm looking forward to that but the Thank, uh, thank you again, man. Uh, uh, much appreciated. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be chatting soon. All right. Appreciate it. Uh, guys, I will get this posted up uh, quickly. And if you have any um, questions for Paper Alpha, re reach out to him, give him a follow. And uh, we'll be back um, probably tomorrow or the next day with the next episode. But until then, um, 
invest with instincts. Uh, I'll have to put a, uh, I'm going to do a little intro separately for, for you because we never actually introduced who you were. So I'll make sure that happens. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was nice talking to you and I'll, I'll make sure it looks pretty good. So have yeah, a good day. Man. Um, and we will chat soon. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Yeah. All the best.